I am going to make it clear that you're Mr. Poverty. The home and abroad, you want to be. <laughs> you got the responsibility, you got the authority, you got the power, you got the money. Now, you may not have the glands. The glands? Yeah. I got plenty of glands. All right. It has been estimated by most economists in our country that there are upwards of 30 million poor people in the United States today. 13 million of them are children, most of whom undoubtedly will end up by living their whole lives in poverty unless you and we together do something to make sure that they have a genuine chance, a real American chance to escape from poverty. Our first objective is to free 30 million Americans from the prison of poverty. In the 1960s, President Lyndon Johnson sounded a nationwide call to end poverty. Can you help us free these Americans from the prison of poverty? And if you can, let me hear your voices. It was a time of momentous change in America. For more than a decade, the civil rights movement had been challenging the country to confront its history of bigotry and expand its practice of democracy. The movement awoke in the nation's leaders a new social consciousness and pushed them to action. Robert Sergeant Shriver was at the center of it all. He led the Catholic Interracial Council in Chicago and earned the support of national civil rights leaders for John Kennedy's presidential campaign. He was then called upon to set up America's new program to reach out to the developing world, the Peace Corps. And now, President Johnson would look to Sergeant Shriver to build a national campaign against poverty. With Lyndon Johnson, probably 50 different reasons he chose Sergeant. Many of them had to do with everything from Bobby Kennedy to, you know, all kinds of other reasons. But the fact is, he knew Sarge could reach out to every community and put this together. And now, tell us how to get started on Project Head Start with Sergeant Shriver. Head Start. Peace Corps, Job Corps, legal services. I don't know of anybody who has ever created this kind of unique set of programs and made them work. We inaugurated something called community action. Therefore, we expect action at the community level. And when you've got action, you've got arguments, you've got dissent, you've got differences of opinion. Of all the national programs Sergeant Shriver created, legal services would become the most influential and the most controversial. This is a start in the, in the war against poverty. First envisioned by Edgar and Jean Kahn, this bold new program would deploy lawyers to impoverished communities to offer the poor the power to be heard in America's courts. We proposed a vehicle that would protect people who had no access to law, and Sarge suddenly saw that this was uh, a key element, a central element of the entire war on poverty. There are many ways in which this war on poverty should be conducted. That was Shriver secured the backing of the American Bar Association, and he recruited attorneys Earl Johnson and Clint Bamberger to run the program. Within a matter of months, hundreds of young lawyers responded to their appeal to bring justice and opportunity to America's poor. What you are saying to poor people is, we're going to provide lawyers who can represent you. It was a terrific change and a radical change. And Sarge Travers saw it, made it happen. Farm workers would live wherever they could. So sometimes tent camps would be set up, uh, sometimes they would live in barns. Children would work with the families as young as five or six years of age. There was no water for the workers, there were no chemical toilets, there was an element of indignity. And so it was a matter of, of taking life as life was provided to you, I think. 
No one in California lived in more grinding poverty than migrant workers. To a group of idealistic lawyers, it was an obvious place to start. With a grant from the Office of Economic Opportunity, they set up California Rural Legal Assistance, or CRLA, and became one of Shriver's first anti-poverty legal programs. We will be representing the poor people, we will continue to accept cases, and we will continue to represent them to the best of our ability and the highest legal tradition. Our ideal, actually, was that we would operate like a large law firm. And so we were able to formulate plans based on the, on the issues that we saw going on throughout the state. I've come to give you a report. CRLA lawyers translated those issues into legal challenges. They went to court to demand drinking water and chemical toilets in the fields, and won. They challenged the use of the short-handled hoe, which caused back crippling injuries to thousands of farm workers. They won again. And when a mother discovered that her Spanish-speaking child had been given an IQ test in English and then placed in a class for the retarded, CRLA once again went to court. And we discovered that all of the children in that class were, were Latino. In fact, it turned out that it was happening throughout the state. Instead of learning math and how to read, the children were playing with blocks and coloring books. CRLA pushed the case all the way to the California Supreme Court, and once again, they won. 22,000 Mexican-American children were freed from classrooms for the mentally retarded. These were youngsters whose educational lives really needed to be saved, and the lawsuit was the principal way in which we were able to do that. We have been CRLA was now a potent champion for the rural poor. When it won a court case that reversed Governor Reagan's budget cuts in health services, the group drew his attention. Uh, we think that it's gone a little afield in which it's kind of become a promoter of social causes. Governor Reagan probably will veto the program when it comes up for refunding in a few weeks. In the contentious climate of the early 1970s, CRLA found itself in a fight to stay alive. Shriver, now ambassador to France, rushed to California to stand up for the program he had launched. For the first time in the history of this country, poor people actually have a place and a way in which to express themselves. You can just imagine in local jurisdictions with legal services lawyers for the first time were suing these powerful interests and suing government, what the reaction was. He stood up to it. Señor, tenía cita para ver a usted, que no? Shriver and others saved CRLA's funding. But across the nation, anti-poverty lawyers came under attack. He bought into a mess of trouble uh, and stood by it. He was putting his personal capital on the line. And all the credibility that he had bought with the Peace Corps and his own reputation as somebody from the private sector who had been successful. He was very clear that this had to be one of what he called national emphasis programs, that this had to stand up along with Head Start as one of the major, major thrusts of the war on poverty. And uh, I'm mighty proud that he did. He's, he's a fighter. He doesn't back off. The fact is we're doing things and we're affecting people who have never been affected before. We're giving a voice to people who have never been heard before. When that happens, that means action. That means controversy. That means excitement. And that means criticism. And that means all those things. But why get discouraged? In fact, I think it's encouraging. Good afternoon, Ms. Ryan. In its first six months of operations, the Neighborhood Legal Services Program handled 93,000 clients and won nearly 75% of its court cases. What a great change this was to put legal services programs in every state. To have thousands of legal services lawyers working with clients filing hundreds of thousands of cases. To ensure that these lawyers had the backup to succeed, Shriver and others set up the National Center on Poverty Law. What Sarge did was build a system where you could train and keep lawyers informed in a way that they could compete in the courts with any lawyers in the country. They'd even be better because they were more passionate and committed and involved with their clients in a way because they cared so much about it. 
The center served as a strategy and communications hub, equipped with a poverty law journal and a law library. It created a repository of knowledge and a, and a conduit of information and a way to, to knit together this uh, far-flung network of advocates for poor people into uh, maybe too grandiose to say, but sort of like one huge law firm for the poor. Prior to 1965, no legal aid attorney had ever taken a case to the U.S. Supreme Court. In the first five years of legal services, more than 200 cases involving the rights of the poor reached the high court. Well over half were won, improving the lives of millions. It changed whole bodies of law. It also changed the legal profession. It also changed the code of professional responsibility. It also changed legal education, and it changed legal scholarship. Legal service attorneys were able to make equal justice for all, sort of a value that's accepted and acknowledged here in America for everybody. But as America entered the 1980s, the president and some in Congress held a different view of legal services. It's a program the Reagan administration would like to cut from the $321 million it gets this year down to zero. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, the far right of the Republican Party was essentially angry at Legal Services Corporation. They tended to win their cases. They tended to prove their points. I thought they were doing uh, the Lord's work. They were protecting poor people who had no access to justice otherwise to get fair and decent working conditions and education for their children and health care and things that I think are fundamental to this democracy. I'm a Republican and a fairly conservative one, but I happen to think that those are essential uh, parts of our democracy. Evidently, those on the far right disagreed. We had some tumultuous hearings. People were trying to kill Legal, legal Services Corporation, and working with others, uh, we were able to prevent that. Yet its opponents persisted, and a decade later, Congress stripped legal services of funding for the National Center on Poverty Law. Congress, in its infinite wisdom, uh, determined that since it couldn't get rid of legal services, uh, that it would cripple it. But Shriver and others would not let the center die. They secured private funding, expanded training and education programs, and developed a web-based poverty law library. Today, pro bono and anti-poverty lawyers use the center's law library more than 1,200 times a day. And once again, in the middle of it, rallying poverty lawyers and their supporters is Robert Sargent Shriver. I honestly believe that having been at these meetings for 20, 25, or 30 years, I'm continually inspired over and over again. New and exciting developments always occur because of all of you men and women here this morning, or this evening, or tomorrow. <laughs> Everyone falls in love with Sarge. They fall in love with him as a person. They fall in love with that enthusiasm and that commitment of a man who really cares about what he's doing. And that continues to inspire a lot of people. But what you said, I think, uh, transcends that. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm sort of out there alone crusading. I realize that I'm not. And then you meet someone like him who just gives you that positive reinforcement and, and reminds you of why you're doing this. I think you'd be surprised at the number that would join you in this program. But until that's done, the rest of it is just talk. Mr. Schreiber, do you really believe that poverty can be wiped out? Yes, I do. Uh, I disagree with those who feel that grinding poverty the kind of poverty I mean is the kind of poverty where you have very bad medical care, very bad housing, very bad education. She's that the type kind of, of person poverty. I'd like to be when I grow up. Really, a person who, who had done well professionally, but kept a large part of himself for the, for the common weal. And that's what we need to instill in our young people, uh, the notion that, yes, you need to worry about yourself, but there's also a neighborhood to worry about, and there's a country to worry about, and there's a world to worry about. And part of you ought to be about making those parts a little bit better while you're on this earth. And I think that, that's, to me, that's what Sergeant demonstrated. Each one of us 
has the opportunity to think about whether or not we wish to devote our intelligence, our time, our energy, our moral outlook to work for the richest people on earth, or we want to use all those same qualities to help the poor. Some people have to be dedicated by God or by themselves to help the poor who most need help. And that's what we're doing. And let you and we together do something to make sure that they have a genuine chance, a real American chance to escape from poverty.